I think this might be a sign that I'm starting to lose my mind. So, I imagine some of you are giving me weird looks right now, for one reason or another, but likely due to the choice of topic for this video. Well, to answer the most likely question, that being the question of why, I'll get back to you on that one. To give a quick rundown for anyone who may not be familiar with the material at hand, Aragon started off as a fantasy novel written by the then still in his teens at the time, Christopher Paolini. It was released in 2002 and served as the first book of Paolini's fantasy series, The Inheritance Cycle. Despite its mixed reception from critics, largely due to how much of its story and world shared similarities to other stories like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, The Inheritance Cycle did get a pretty notable following in the mid-2000s, something it still has to this day. I first read the books in my high school years, around the time the final book was released, and I thoroughly enjoyed them. Granted, yes, the first book can be a bit rough at points, you can kind of tell it was written by a teenager, but Paolini's character writing and world building did improve over the course of the series, allowing for a pretty satisfying conclusion in my opinion. But of course, since these books were being written during the years that the Harry Potter movies were coming out, the film industry did what it was doing with any teen slash young adult novel they could get their hands on, and tried to kickstart their own film series, in hopes they would get Harry Potter's levels of success. And thus, in 2006, we got a film adaptation of Aragon, and surprise surprise, it didn't go over very well. I'm not entirely sure how this happened, but the film managed to rip the source material of the identity it did have, resulting in a movie that felt even more by the numbers. Needless to say, fans were understandably frustrated by this adaptation, while the average moviegoer was quick to forget it even existed, and despite doing decently in the box office, the film series never kicked off. But, with this being a movie from the 2000s aiming to be mainstream, this of course meant that movie tie-in games were bound to happen, and sure enough, we did get Aragon tie-in games that came out a full month before the movie did. That's both very odd and very concerning. I originally was just going to take a look at the main console version in some sort of compilation video in the future, like in obscure licensed games or something. But after finding out just how different every version of the game was, my curiosity got the better of me. Which brings us here today. I have in my possession all four versions of the Aragon game. The main console version, I specifically have it on PS2, the PSP version, the Nintendo DS version, and the Game Boy Advance version. And yes, we're going to take a look at every single one of them in this video because... Nope, I still don't have a reason. Oh, and just to be safe for anyone who may be interested in reading the books, there will be spoiler talks, so uh, yeah, just a heads up. To start things off, we're going to take a look at the PS2 version, which was developed by Stormfront Studios. I didn't know about this until I got to scripting, but Stormfront actually had a bit of a notable legacy under their belt before making this game. Having previously developed 1991's Neverwinter Nights, the first ever MMORPG to display graphics, and the pretty well received tie-in game for Lord of the Rings The Two Towers. That said, Aragon was the second last game the studio made before they shut down, so this really could go either way. The game begins with... I'm just gonna put it bluntly, one of the weirdest cutscenes I've ever seen in a video game. Like, it's just a standard opening narration cutscene, the whole, the world was good until it wasn't, ordeal. But the direction it goes visually is nothing short of bizarre. Seriously, let me show you a sample of it. But that time has long passed, and the ruthless Galbatorix now rules the land. And Duza, a wicked shit, enforces Galbatorix's iron rule. But the reach of despots is limited, and even Galbatorix couldn't touch one unsuspecting farm boy. On one hand, I suppose I could give points for creativity for a game that's otherwise as visually generic as you can get for the PS2, but on the other hand, this constant shift and mix of visual styles within single cutscenes just comes off as really jarring and confusing. And yeah, this happens several times throughout the game, and I can't tell if it was done because of budget constraints or because the devs wanted to get artsy. To give a bit of credit, I can kind of understand doing weird effects for the main antagonist Durza, given the unnatural state he's in as a shade, but everything else really just leaves me baffled. Though while on the topic of the cutscenes... I did not edit that. There is actually a Wilhelm scream in the game. In fact, it uses the Wilhelm scream again later on, and I actually predicted it right before it happened while I was playing. I think you used the Wilhelm scream again, aren't they? Oh, yeah, there it is. 
But yeah, the game follows the plot layout of the movie. The evil king Galatorx wants to prevent the rise of new dragon riders, has Durza hunt down a stolen egg in the possession of the elf Arya, she teleports it away after an ambush from Durza, a farm boy named Aragon finds it while hunting, also Aragon can apparently jump up to cliff tops, what the heck. He forms a bond with the hatched dragon, who he names Sephira, creatures known as the Razak are sent to Aragon's village to find the egg, and they kill Aragon's uncle in the process, prompting Aragon and Sephira, along with the village storyteller and former dragon rider Brom, to make their way to the hideout of the Varden, the resistance group fighting against Galbatorx's reign. There's more that goes on, of course, but for the sake of talking about the game, that's all you'll really need to know for the time being. The game covers the story in a rather abridged manner, though to be fair, that was pretty common with movie tie-in games at the time, so I won't put much focus on how the story is handled in this game. Most of my issues with the story would stem from the movie anyway, like how the Razak are a massive downgrade in the movie compared to how they are in the books. Seriously, the Razak were like the coolest villains in the books, these creepy, bird-like servants of Galbatorx that were a continuous threat. It took until the third book for Aragon to hunt them down and kill them. Meanwhile, in the movie, and by extension the game, the Razak are these insect mummy demons? And not only do they die while fighting Aragon and Brom, especially annoying when you consider that they're the cause of Brom's death in the books, but rather pathetically no less. But okay, I'll get off my anti-Aragon movie soapbox for now and focus back on the game. So what kind of direction does this game go gameplay-wise? Well, to put it simply... It's Devil May Cry. A heavy emphasis on hack slash combat with some light elements of exploration and puzzle solving and a frequent use of fixed camera angles, this is basically a fancy version of Devil May Cry. Coincidentally, the Aragon games came out the same year as Devil May Cry 3 Special Edition, which was widely regarded as the best game in the series up until DMC5 came out, so that definitely doesn't do Aragon any favors. That said though, I'm not inherently opposed to this direction. A less good Devil May Cry could potentially still be a good game, and the idea of an over-the-top hack and slash in a fantasy setting Honestly, sounds like it could be pretty cool. That said, would anyone be surprised if I said the game wasn't able to achieve those possibilities? Because it definitely doesn't. To give some credit, the combat does have some good weight to it. And while it keeps it simple, the way magic can be used in battle can be pretty effective. Such as a spell that not only can push or pull enemies, but can also remove shields from certain enemies. Or, if you want to get rid of enemies quickly, just use the fire spell Brisinger when nearby a ledge. As more often than not, the enemy AI will automatically gravitate towards the ledge and just jump off. Bit of a cheap tactic, yes. But as I'm going to go over shortly, you're going to need every cheap tactic you can get. See, despite the weight in your sword swings, hits often feel like you're doing nothing to your enemies. And that's because enemies very rarely stagger upon being hit. Because of this, even when performing a combo, it's easy for the enemy to just casually interrupt it and knock you down without a chance to avoid it, not helped by the fact that the dodge roll is really finicky, often moving in an unpredictable direction as if they're locked onto something. The stagger issue especially applies to fighting Urgles, whose movie counterparts are already a letdown as is. Seriously, we went from this in the books to this in the movie. On top of that, they're large, fast, have long hit range, take a ton of hits to kill, and in some of the later levels, you get swarmed by them. Literally three levels in a row, the only enemies are Urgles, and they are frustrating to fight. I nearly gave up on all three of these levels because of enemy encounters with them. The other problem with combat in this game is that, by all technicality, there's no reason to partake in it. Aside from the few points where you're trapped in an area until you defeat all the enemies, you can just book it from every fight and continue onwards. In comparison, in the Devil May Cry games, defeating enemies reward you with red orbs, your means of getting new moves and abilities, and you get more red orbs by having a higher style rank both from having varied combos and from not taking hits, incentivizing not only partaking in fights, but doing your best in them. Aragon has nothing like that. No real reason to fight enemies unless the game literally won't let you progress until you do so. And aside from the situational magic spells you unlock as you progress through the story, you don't get any new attacks over the course of the game, so combat does become quite repetitive, not helped by the previous staggering issue. However, there is one problem with running from fights. See, Aragon is a co-op game, with Brom serving as Player 2's character. Well, up until Brom dies. That's when Mr. Antihero Murtog shows up and takes the spot. And yes, I know his name is technically pronounced Murtag, but I'm sorry, Murtog just sounds better. But when playing solo, Player 2's character will be AI controlled, and even when running from fights, the AI will tend to stay behind and try to fight the enemies. Problem is, if your AI partner dies, you get a game over. Granted, I still ran from many fights despite this, and just hoped the new area was close enough that I could get to before my AI partner ran out of health, but regardless, I can't say I'm a fan of putting potential failure in the hands of an AI. But there's more to a Devil May Cry style game than just the combat, so how's the exploration and puzzle solving? Well... 
Not very good to be honest. Much of the level design is pretty bland, with very little reason to go off the beaten path, other than to find a health pickup if need be, or to find each level's hidden dragon egg, which only unlocks extra goodies like development videos for the game. Point is, the level design doesn't have a lot going for it, and the same goes with the puzzle solving. Most times, it's just a matter of using a context-sensitive spell when the game prompts you to, which requires you to just stand there until the spell finishes charging. A lot of spells are like this, actually, and it can be quite annoying when you're trying to do this while enemies are around and out to attack you. The boss fight against the Razak is especially guilty of this. Also, some of these levels get needlessly long, with the worst one by far being Durza's Fortress. It's not even a hard level up until the end where you fight Durza and his annoying flying swords. It's just horribly repetitive. The whole level took me nearly an hour to complete, not helped by the fact that this level, along with some of the levels right before, has some utterly abysmal lighting. Oh yeah, there's a fun fact for you. Several of these gameplay clips I've had to edit the brightness on just so you can see what's going on. You want to see how bright it actually is? Yeah, it's really bad. Actually, you know what? Let's go two for two. Here's another example. And again, because this is a DMC-style game, you also gotta deal with fixed camera angles, which granted could get annoying even in DMC3, very happy they're 100% gone in DMC5, but Aragon consistently uses really awkward camera angles both when exploring and fighting, and this combined with the bad lighting really makes some parts of the game far more annoying than they need to be. Though on a bit more of a positive note, the one level that I can say that I actually kind of enjoyed is the last level before the final boss, the big war against Galbatorx's army of 400. I know it's 400 because the goal of the level is to slay every single one of Galbatorx's troops. Now granted, there are some parts where Sephira will clear a large number for you, but still, this is kind of a neat way to portray taking down an army in a game like this. Sure, it's a bit repetitive, but at the very least, the staggering issue was miraculously less frequent in this one level, so it actually felt kind of fun to play through. Though speaking of fun, you do get to partake in some dragon riding a handful of times in the game, and in the first instance of it, it actually is pretty fun. It's like playing a licensed game equivalent to Panzer Dragoon, flying around and dodging both the environment and enemy attacks as you target and shoot at your foes. The Razak in the case of the first flying level. The second flying level, however, is all kind of not good. It's an on-rails tower defense, two descriptors that shouldn't go together. If a tower's in trouble and the on-rail path currently has you on the other side of the map, well, not much you can do about it until the path has you go in that direction. This level was just a slog to get through. The last flying level is also the final battle against Durza. This this one's all right, not much to say really. Moving on to more technical stuff, the visuals are, well, definitely from a licensed PS2 game. It does kind of look like an earlier PS2 game though, which really isn't helped by the fact that this game came out the same week as the PlayStation 3. As for the music, it's actually pretty all right. Nothing you're gonna necessarily get stuck in your head, but it's fittingly atmospheric and has some really nice sounding pieces. Also, there's one song on the soundtrack that's used for both the main menu and one of the later levels, and silly as it is to say this, I can't help but be amused at part of the instrumentation, particularly this part right here. Yes, I know my sense of humor is in shambles. On the topic of audio, something kind of neat is that they actually got a few of the main cast members from the movie to reprise their roles for the game, naming the actors for Aragon, Arya, Murtog, and Durza. I know the cast was an aspect of the film many fans didn't care for, but seeing actors from a film reprise their roles for the tie-in game isn't super common, so it is kind of neat to see. That said, it is very unfortunate that they weren't able to get Jeremy Irons back as Brom, which was easily the best casting choice the movie made, and the voice actor they have as Brom in the game isn't really trying to sound like Jeremy Irons, which honestly is pretty distracting. We have to defeat those archers. The gate locks are within the towers. Call in Safira. She can take care of them for us. Now, frame rate wise, Aragon is actually pretty consistent, with only very minor hiccups here and there which even then was likely more so because PS2 emulation is a bit finicky. That said, I did experience a handful of rather bizarre glitches, namely an audio clip getting cut off too early, not being able to set off this bell until the game decided it wanted to work, but most hilariously, this. Granted, this was also due to emulation, as apparently a certain setting in the PS2 emulator causes this to happen. Can't say I entirely know how it works, but I was definitely amused. And equally amused when I finally went to the emulator settings to fix the problem. So yeah, Aragon on PS2 is... Not very good. What's unfortunate is that there definitely are signs of a good, or at least decent, game here, but it sadly missed the mark. So in conclusion, if you want a fancy themed Devil May Cry style game, best to just wait until Final Fantasy 16 comes out. Which hey, it's being made by the Final Fantasy 14 team and supposedly has one of DMC5's designers on board as well. So we should be in good hands when that rolls around.
While we wait for that though, how's about we jump over to the PSP version? While the console version was developed by Stormfront Studios, this version was developed by Amaze Entertainment, a studio with a large resume in licensed games. Though the only game of theirs that I'm personally familiar with is their DS port of LEGO Star Wars 2. The notoriously glitchy DS port of LEGO Star Wars 2. Actually, that's not entirely true. Wait, what? Who are you? Oh, I'm you from the future. Oh, so, wait, the future's grayscale? N no, actually, that's just an effect of time travel. Things that aren't from your point in time appear in grayscale. You and everything around us is grayscale from my perspective. Huh. Anyway, I'm just here to quickly correct that I, er, we, rather, know Amaze Entertainment for other games than just the DS port of LEGO Star Wars 2, but we'll get into that later on. Wait, we will? Don't worry, you'll see for yourself. Anyway, that's all I need to say. Take care. Huh. Not entirely sure what the point of that was. Well, anyway, let's get back to business. Also, as a quick disclaimer before we really begin, you may notice that all the text in the footage is kind of a mess. I looked into it, and it seems to be an emulation-exclusive issue with this game. Why exactly it does this when pretty much every other PSP game on emulation keeps its textile, or at least text size, intact, is beyond me. But regardless, I wouldn't hold this against the game. Though trust me, if I were able to record directly from my PSP, I would. But anyway, like the PS2 version, this game follows a Cliff Notes version of the movie story, though it's actually even more abridged than the PS2 version. Saphira hatches out of her egg pretty much right after it appears before Aragon, rather than him taking the egg back to his village to try and sell it, and then finding out at home that it's a dragon egg. Seems this game's eager to get right into the action, so I guess let's just get right into it. Now, with most PSP versions of games that were also on PS2, more often than not, the PSP version would end up being either a scaled-down port of the PS2 version, or at the very least, a game of a very similar style. Aragon PSP, on the other hand, decided to play by its own rules, because it's nothing like the PS2 version. For one, you don't even play as Aragon in this game. Well, aside from when he's riding Saphira. That's because, for this version, you spend the entirety playing as Saphira. And I'm just going to put it out there right off the bat, I really like this idea. With dragon riding being a core aspect of the series as a whole, having an Aragon game where you play as the dragon is a really cool concept. So right from the get-go, I was down for this. And at the start of the tutorial level, things were shaping up really well. Basic movement controls felt good, Saphira's got a fair few options for maneuvering, including strafing and a move that immediately turns her 180 degrees. So far, this is going great! But then you reach this part of the tutorial, where you have to practice your fire breath on a bunch of wild animals on the ground. This is where the first major problem of the game emerges combat. With this being based on the story of the first book, there aren't going to be a lot of airborne enemies, as other surviving dragons don't start making their presence known until later books. Because of this, pretty much all of your enemies are landlocked, and it's incredibly awkward to attack enemies because of that. Not helped by how absolutely tiny they are. Like, I get it, I'm playing as a big dragon, but pretty much all the enemies are far too small targets, so most attempts to attack them are going to result in Saphira getting stuck on the terrain. And I know I just praised the movement controls a bit ago, but man, Saphira gets stuck on stuff far too easily, and the 180 move isn't always going to be a reliable way to get out of that. More often than not, I didn't even bother trying to use my fire breath on enemies. I'd usually just grab them when prompted to and eat them, which not only takes them out in one hit, but also restores health. But even that can be unreliable depending on your position compared to the enemy, as you need to be moving forward at a decent speed to be able to grab them to begin with. The one type of attack that I do think is kind of interesting though is magic, which is only usable in levels where Aragon's with you, as instead of having specific inputs like in the PS2 version, they're pickups that you then toggle through, alongside Aragon's bow and arrows. They can range from Brazinger to a reflection spell to even a time slowing spell, so I don't remember that being something from the books. I do find it funny though that all the spells just have regular names like Time Slow or Ice Storm, meanwhile the fire spell uses its in-universe name. Gotta get points to the PS2 version here for at least keeping consistent with the spells all using their in-universe names. Enemies aren't the only things Saphira can pick up though, she can also pick up boulders and toss them at things to help destroy them. However, even though there's a targeting system, the momentum of the boulder upon throwing it will depend on the speed you're moving at the time. In other words, having the boulder land where you want it to is a fair bit more tedious of a process than it should be. So yeah, fighting's kind of janky, but that does beg the question, is that all you do in this game? Well, kind of. Many of the game's missions are... protection missions. Protect Aragon's farm animals from being killed by wolves. Protect Aragon from being killed by Galbatorx's soldiers. Protect Aragon and Brom from being killed by Urgles. Protect Brom from being killed by Urgles and then by the Razak. Protect Murtog from being killed by Urgles. And they're so long and repetitive. And the people you're supposed to protect die so easily. Murtog especially. I actually ended up quitting on the mission where you have to escort Murtog. You never have enough time to restock on your spell, the pickup area being near the start of the section, without him dying before you get back. I was already beyond bored at this point, and I really didn't want to deal with an escort mission with an escort this squishy. 
Now what is kind of strange is that Aragon and PSP actually has multiplayer, where you customize your own Dragon Rider and Dragon, and then partake in battles with other players' custom Dragon Riders. Granted, the options you have for customization at the start are very limited, and the strange text issue made it a nightmare to decipher everything, but yeah, this exists. The single player story does have arena challenges that you unlock alongside the main levels, giving you a chance to try out the battles against AI players, though I only ended up doing the tutorials. I was going to give the arena challenges a try after beating the story, but, well, I didn't end up beating the story, so I never got around to doing so. Whoops. As for the technical stuff, the game looks... eh? I get that PSP emulation may have an effect on how this looks, what with it taking up more screen than it was designed to, but even then, other games on PSP emulation look far better than this. Heck, the PSP was capable of far better looking games than this in general. And the music is... unremarkable. The only tracks that stood out to me were ones that had just been reused from the PS2 version. But yeah, Aragon and PSP was honestly kind of a letdown. I really like the concept, and as far as I'm aware at least, there aren't really any notable dragon simulators out there, so I was hoping this could pull it off, but it rather unfortunately and to be perfectly honest, I think I disliked this one more than the PS2 version, because at least with that game, while it was frustrating and not well made, it at least showed signs of what could have been a good game if it got more time in the oven. Aside from those first few minutes of the tutorial where I was just flying around, Aragon on PSP was just kinda dull. Literally the most entertaining aspect of the game after those first few minutes was this message the tutorial gave me when teaching me about grabbing objects. Good! You picked up a rock! With that said, let's move on from the PlayStation systems and on to the Nintendo ones. Maybe they'll give us some better Aragon games. Up first, we've got the Nintendo DS version, also developed by Amaze Entertainment. Admittedly, that's got me concerned coming off the PSP version, but you know what? I'ma try to stay optimistic, hoping for the best. This time around, the game opens with art pieces to tell of the confrontation between Durza and Arya. Though with this art style, Durza's looking more like Melee Ganondorf with longer hair. We then jump immediately into gameplay as Aragon in the midst of hunting, much like in the PS2 version. Seems this won't be like the PSP version, so I'm curious to see what direction this version goes. Okay, first impressions, the game looks pretty alright for an early DS game, and I'm impressed that the frame rate is as consistently stable as it is. The visuals actually kinda remind me of the DS version of Sin 2. Don't know why that was the specific example I went to, but they give me a similar vibe. A little odd that there's no music currently, but I imagine that'll change once I progress. Aragon's movement controls do feel a little bit awkward, but I think that's more so due to the hardware limitations rather than the game itself, what with being restrained to the D-pad. The jump does feel a little bit stiff though, can't blame down the DS hardware. So Aragon on DS, while looking similar to the PS2 version, is actually more of an action RPG rather than a straightforward hack and slash. Your weapons gain experience and level up from killing enemies, which both increases weapon strength and unlocks new attacks, meaning combat actually serves a purpose this time. There's items you collect, like healing items and collectibles that can upgrade your health bar size, you can do side quests, and so on and so forth. Also, speaking of the PS2 version, combat feels... Quite a bit better here to be honest. It's simple, but effective. And landing hits does feel good, and enemies actually stagger in this game, so it's not a hassle. Granted, it can be annoying when you get swarmed by enemies, as not many of your attacks early on are good at covering multiple directions, so it's easy to get overwhelmed, especially by Urgles. But the combat does overall feel like an improvement over the PS2 versions, despite it being simpler. I unfortunately didn't get far enough to see what magic would be like though, but I suspect it's a lot like using a healing item. Yeah, for some strange reason, to use your healing items, instead of just tapping on it in your inventory, you have to tap on it in your inventory, then you need to draw this shape on the touchscreen, and then the item will be used. Like, I get it's an early DS game, gotta take full advantage of those touch controls, but like, why make something as simple as healing so obtuse? The bow and arrow also incorporates touch controls, and admittedly I was expecting them to be awful, like you'd have to pull back the arrow by dragging down on the touchscreen. But surprisingly, it's a lot simpler than that. When using your bow, you go into first person, and you use the touchscreen to move your camera. You hold the L button to pull back and let go to fire the arrow. And there's even a slight lock on with your target, so using the bow and arrow is shockingly responsive. That's not the only surprise this game has up its sleeves though. Something that completely caught me off guard is that the DS version actually incorporates plot points from the book that weren't in the movie. For instance, in the book, Aragon's cousin Rorin is in love with Katrina, the daughter of the village butcher Sloane, and serves as the reason why Rorin leaves town to find new work, so he can marry Katrina and be able to provide for both of them. Both Rorin and Katrina are integral characters in the later books, but I imagine because Katrina isn't doing much in the first book, she was removed from the movie. There actually were scenes filmed with her in them, but they were cut and only could be found in the DVD's deleted scenes. Point of the matter is, she's present in the DS version, helping Aragon by supplying him with some meat after Sloane refuses to take the dragon egg as payment. 
Another example is in the naming of Sephira. In the book, Aragon discusses potential names with the then unnamed Sephira. While in the movie, Sephira tells Aragon her name the moment she's old enough to speak. The DS version carries over the name discussion from the book, which was kind of a pleasant surprise. And continuing on surprises, the DS version actually includes a gameplay mechanic for the mind touch. To quickly explain, dragon riders and their dragons have the ability to communicate with one another through their thoughts, without the need to say a word. The PS2 version brings up this plot point in one of the cutscenes, but never really portrays it much. The DS version, however, has this shape-drawing minigame whenever Aragon and Sephira are speaking with one another, with more of each other's thoughts being unveiled with each successful shape drawn. It's a... unique mechanic to say the least. Also one of the shapes you draw is the Waluigi symbol, so this game's an immediate 10 out of 10. Though speaking of Sephira, there are gameplay sections where you get to ride her, like in the PS2 version. And it's easily the worst flying controls across these games thus far. The movement is way too sensitive. You lightly tap the direction and she practically zooms to that side of the screen. Also the section I played was just her flying through rings. Riveting. That said, all around, the DS version's pretty alright. Nothing amazing, but it is quite a bit better than the PS2 and PSP versions. I would've played more of it if it weren't for one little problem. The checkpoint placement. Littered throughout the world are these dragon statues that serve as your save points. And whenever you die, you'll respawn at the last dragon statue you used. Thing is though, there's not a lot of them. So you can and will lose a lot of progress after death. Which, given the enemy swarming issue I brought up earlier, tends to happen a lot. Also, the music does end up picking up, resulting in a pretty atmospheric soundtrack. Granted, I wouldn't say any of the pieces really jumped out at me aside from the song for Carbajal, Aragon's Home Village, but yeah, it's not bad. And while the game does look alright for an early DS game, like I said earlier, some of the animations do look kinda silly. In particular, Brahm's running animation from when you first meet him, look at him go. And rather hilariously, Aragon's charge attack animation if you don't hold it all the way. I genuinely had a good laugh over how goofy this looked. But yeah, DS version was alright from what I played of it. Genuinely pleasant surprise after playing the other versions. And with that, I have a fair bit more hope with the Game Boy Advance version. Speaking of which, how's about we talk about the Game Boy Advance version now? Interestingly, this version was also developed by Amaze Entertainment. Jeez, they really had a lot on their plate Aragon-wise, didn't they? In a way, that kind of makes it more impressive that all these games are so drastically different, knowing they were all done by the same studio. And the GBA version continues this tradition by not being a hack and slash, a dragon simulator, or an action RPG. But we'll get to that in a moment. So while every other version of the game has depicted Durs' attack on Arya as a single cutscene, or at most a handful of cutscenes, the GBA version goes a completely different direction, by having you actually play as Arya and her two companions during the attack, in a prologue of sorts. Can't say I was expecting that, but hey, points for originality. I will say, the visuals in this game are... interesting. Not bad per se, in fact the in-battle sprites look pretty solid, but something about the character sprites on the overworld seems a bit off. They almost kind of remind me of how the characters looked in another GBA game, The Sims Bustin' Out. The dialogue portraits especially give me Bustin' Out vibes. These are definitely the kind of expressions you'd see in that game. Huh. That's the second time I used a Sims comparison point for these Aragon games. Don't know why those games were the first to jump to mind, but eh. So I will admit, as neat as it is to play through the ambush sequence, it does kind of drag a bit too much. I get it, it's meant to be the tutorial, but like, this is based on the first chapter of the book, and was portrayed as, again, the cutscenes in the other games. Not entirely sure it needs to be as long as it is. Not helped by the fact that the enemies in this part of the game are way too strong for what seems to be the powerhouse prologue of sorts. The section that's supposed to give you a taste of how strong you're gonna end up. Definitely didn't feel strong fighting the Urgles. They're serious damage sponges and can do a lot of damage to to you, and even inflict curses that, as far as I'm aware, you have little to no way to get rid of at this point in the game. I also learned that you're able to get soft locked in this prologue by pressing pause mid chest opening animation, which is exactly what happened to me. Couldn't move my cursor, couldn't select any option on the menu, couldn't unpause, I was very stuck. Admittedly, with the soft lock occurring after half an hour of a rather boring prologue that I wasn't even finished with when the soft lock happened, I almost just stopped there. But I decided to start again, this time running from every battle that I was allowed to run from, because I've read the book. I know these two companions are just going to end up dying, and Arya's not going to be playable until at least halfway through the game, so I'm fine with not grinding. So they get attacked by Durza, whose portraits especially look kind of ridiculous. He kills Arya's palette swapped companions. Oh no and Arya sends off the egg before being captured. And I'll just say, I'm honestly pretty glad I decided to continue past the slow prologue, because once you're in control of Aragon, the game's pace picks up quite a bit more. And, as strange as it is to say this, while I only played a few hours of the GBA version, from what I did play of it, 
It's actually pretty good! As you've lately picked up on already through the gameplay footage, Aragon on GBA is a turn-based RPG, but with some rather interesting combat mechanics. For one, the A and B buttons are your means of doing attacks, but when you go to attack, you use a combination of inputs to attack. And depending on the combination you go with, your attack can have different effects on your opponents. One combo may cause a status effect, while another may inflict damage to every single enemy. All of a sudden, there's more incentive to try different combos, especially as you level up, rather than just mash A and B done with it. Magic's also rather interesting. When casting a spell, you have this meter that fluctuates, and the higher it is, the more effective it'll be. But magic also costs health, which actually ties in nicely to how physically draining casting magic is in the books, especially when just starting out. Nice touch! This meter also stabilizes more as you level up your magic, which brings us to another really interesting mechanic in the game. See, in Aragon on GBA, there is this system known as focuses. Stuff like magic, weapons, herbal, and so on. Each character has certain ones they can access, and you set one focus at a time per character. Every time you level up, the focus you have currently set will also level up, which will increase specific character stats depending on what focus your character has set, and will grant other benefits. A higher magic focus level stabilizes your meter when casting magic, a higher weapon focus level gives you access to more attack combos and will let you partake in duels with certain NPCs, a higher herbal focus level allows you to pick up certain herbs and areas, which can be used for potion crafting, etc. It's frankly a pretty creative way to customize your party members and really make each of them your own, and you're able to change a character's focus at any time. So if you want them to start leveling up in another area, you can do that with ease. Also, yes, as I briefly brought up, there's also potion crafting in this game. I didn't see much of it myself, but by using herbs, you can create different types of potions, which from what I hear gets a lot more open for experimentation as the game progresses. You can also forge your weapons to make them stronger and give them special benefits, and like, this is far more in-depth than I was expecting this game to be. Like I said, I only played a few hours, but from what I've researched, this game's length is quite a bit longer than the other games. A dozen hours at least, according to HowLongToBeat.com. Seems this game's got a lot more meat on its bones than any of the other versions. I'm very impressed. And like the DS version, the GBA version includes plot elements from the book that weren't in the movie. Like before, Aragon decides on Saphira's name rather than her just telling him what her name is, and Katrina's not only present, but she's actually a party member for a small portion of the game, and she dual wields freaking butcher knives! I wasn't expecting Katrina of all characters to be so cool! Aragon and Saphira's Mind Touch is also present in this game, but instead of it being a minigame of sorts, it's an option you can pull up from the menu at any time, and allows Aragon and Saphira to mentally discuss recent events and how they feel about them. I quite like this. It very much matches the kind of discussions Aragon and Saphira would often have in the books, and adds just an extra little dabble of characterization for both of them. It's a pretty neat addition. And speaking of Saphira, while you don't ride her like in the other games, she is one of your party members, which is both ridiculous and amazing. Just a dragon completely destroying enemies in turn-based combat. I never realized how much I wanted to see this until this very moment. But yeah, overall, Aragon on GBA was surprisingly good. I'm definitely going to have to come back to this at some point and play through it more. I'm genuinely serious, I had quite a bit of fun with this one, and I can't say I was really expecting that to occur with any of these games. Though one last thing I did want to talk about with this game is the music, which is also really well done. The battle themes are catchy and thrilling, without going too over the top, and the overworld themes are nice and atmospheric, though I did start to get a bit sick of how repetitive the Carvajal Village theme is. But that's not all I wanted to say about the music, because there's something cool about it that I wanted to share. Both the DS and GBA versions were composed by a fellow named Ian Stalker, and he actually went out of his way to share both soundtracks in full on YouTube in their original source state, allowing for cleaner listening experiences than on actual hardware, which is really cool! He also actually collaborated with another composer for the GBA version, one Steven Valima, also known as Sarasu. Name sound familiar? Well, Sarasu just so happens to be one half of the composing duo behind Steven Universe. Can't say you were expecting that, were ya? But yeah, Ian Stalker's actually posted a lot of his old composing work on YouTube, which is pretty cool if you... ask... me. The visuals actually kind of remind me of the DS version of Sims 2. Don't know why that was the specific example I went to, but they give me a similar vibe. Uh, hold on, I need to check now. Did he also do the soundtrack for Sims Bustin... Out? They almost kind of remind me of how the characters looked in another GBA game, The Sims Bustin' Out. The dialogue portraits especially give me Bustin' Out vibes. These are definitely the kind of expressions you'd see in that game. Okay, this can't be a coincidence. I need to look into this more. Let's see, Sims Bustin' Out was developed by Gryptonite Incorporated. Alright, let's look here. Around 2005, Gryptonite as a brand was retired and all operations were done under... a Maze Entertainment's name. And Sims 2 DS was developed by Amaze Entertainment 
as well. It, it makes sense now. The similar visual styles? The well-done soundtracks? These versions of the Aragon game were developed by the same studio that developed two oddly specific games from my childhood! This must be what my future self was telling me about! Wait, I know what I need to do now. No! Though the only game of theirs that I'm personally familiar with is their DS port of LEGO Star Wars 2. The notoriously glitchy DS port of LEGO Star Wars 2. Actually, that's not entirely true. Wait, what? Who are you? Oh, I'm you from the future. Oh, so, wait, the future's grayscale? N no, actually, that's just an effect of time travel. Things that aren't from your point in time appear in grayscale. You and everything around us is grayscale from my perspective. Huh. Anyway, I'm just here to quickly correct that I, er, we, rather, know Amaze Entertainment for other games than just the DS port of LEGO Star Wars 2, but we'll get into that later on. Wait, we will? Don't worry, you'll see for yourself. Anyway, that's all I need to say. Take care. Huh. Not entirely sure what the point of that was. Well, anyway, let's get back to business. You know, in hindsight, there probably wasn't much purpose in doing that. Eh, I guess I just felt the need to tell someone about this oddly specific revelation. But anyway, that concludes the wild ride that is the Aragon games. I can definitely say I wasn't expecting this to get so in-depth, but hey, that's just how it is sometimes. And hey, we actually got some quality among it all, so that's already more than I was expecting. With that said, I've spent way too much time than I ever should have on things based on the Aragon movie, so I best move on to something else. Tune in next time to hear me talk about the Percy Jackson and the Olympians the Lightning Thief movie game on Nintendo DS. I'm joking by the way, I'm not actually going to do that to myself. Doing one video on tying games to a terrible movie based on a book series I really liked was more than enough. I am genuinely serious this time, I'm not actually reviewing it. Hey everyone, not done just yet. First off, thanks for watching this video that ended up way longer than I initially planned. The things I discovered from researching this game during the scripting phase was just kind of mind-boggling for me, and I knew I had to delve into it all. But anyway, before this video ends, I actually want to try a little something new to end off my videos. As many of you are no doubt aware, YouTube's algorithm is kind of a mess nowadays. Heck, I imagine only a handful of the people subscribed to me will even have seen this video in their subscription feeds. But this isn't about me. This is about other YouTubers who have been hit by the algorithm as well. Talented creators who haven't had much of a chance to get their voice out there. So what I'm thinking of doing at the end of each of these videos now is a personal recommendation section where I give, well, a personal recommendation for a YouTuber to look into. I just want to do what I can to help signal boost some really talented video makers who I believe deserve more attention on the platform. And to start things off, I'm going to recommend to you all a talented British fellow who goes by the name Soup Lexi. I brought him up in a previous video, but I felt I should give him a proper shout out because man does he deserve it. He may not release videos on a super frequent basis, but when he does, they are absolutely hilarious. Most notably, he has a series of videos called The Smart Way, where he... It's hard to describe what kind of videos they are. He plays through games, but they're not quite reviews or let's plays, they're... Well, the smart way. Here, let me play a few clips for you to give you an idea of what his stuff is like. Mecha Knuckles. At several points, I'd look at the map and question where he was going. He's the explorer type. He's also the type that never appeared in another game. He has all the abilities of Knuckles in regards to the fact he can fly, go straight through walls, and that's my favorite Knuckles. I know what I must do. Victory! That's a victory! This shark is obviously hiding something. Bananas, nothing useful. It was shark bait! Mine cart madness. Ah! Actually, it didn't take that long. I wonder what this level's gimmick is. Oh, uh oh. Ah! Saving other jigs and the back kidnapped Pikachu! You give it back right now! Pikachu, no! Well, he's gone now. Time to steal his stuff. Yo, what, man? I'll have you for supper. Where did you get those balloons from? The dollar store! He also streams on Twitch, if that's more up your alley. And he even uploads highlights from some of his streams. But yeah, if you enjoy yourself some chaotic comedy, Suplexy's a great provider of that. So feel free to check his stuff out. A link to his work is in the description. With that said, now we'll be wrapping up the video. This has been Black Mage Benjamin, and until the next video, have a nice day, everybody.